Ladies and gentlemen, we proudly present America's 26 newest naval aviators. Just two weeks ago, these student pilots of the Naval Air Station at Meridian, Mississippi, flew their A-4 Skyhawks over the ocean for the first time. First Lieutenant Cherry Carrot qualified in the A-4 on board USS John F. Kennedy. They approached an aircraft carrier 100 miles off the coast of Florida. Lieutenant J.G. Michael C. Crisp, call sign Critter. Remembered to drop their hooks. Lieutenant J.G. Bartell was named to the Commodore's list during the advanced Slammed onto train. the deck at 150 miles an hour. caught a wire. In the Navy's oldest airplane, they have become the newest members of the elite tail hook fraternity. It's 90% attitude and 10% ability, by the way. <laughs> to each and every one of the new wingies, I wish you all the very best in the days ahead. It will be at least a year before these men are truly ready to face the test of combat. But in the plane they fly, the A-4 Skyhawk, and in the tactics they use, they confront every day the history of one of the Navy's longest battles. In 1966, our country was already becoming embroiled in the conflict in Southeast Asia in a small country by the name of Vietnam. We went out to win the war. We fully expected to win the war and get it over with. We didn't drop our bombs and go home. We dropped our bombs and went and looked. We were out there to find some trucks to, to blow them up. To find the barge and to sink it. We wanted to get a little hate and discontent in the game. In 1967, at the height of the air war over North Vietnam, Brian Compton commanded an A-4 attack squadron called the Saints on the USS Oriskany. The attack pilots of the Oriskany saw more action and suffered more combat losses over North Vietnam than any other group in the Navy. The ball game is a different one once you go into combat. And you've got to use all the instincts you have to become uh, an elusive, uh, sure-footed fighter. Is there anybody here who doesn't know who this great man is? Jim Stockdale is probably best known today for his 1992 debut on the national political stage. In 1965, he was leading the pilots of the Oriskany into combat for the first time. The ability to improvise and to know that all of that peacetime stuff is out the window. A lot of people give that up very, very hesitantly. Jim started off, you know, working fairly low to the ground. You can get it so high you can't hardly see Vietnam. As a matter of fact, some of those guys, I think, would have lost the bombs in from the coastline if they could. But, you know, his attitude was to get in there and, and to, to hit the target. On board the Oriskany, under Jim Stockdale's command, 120 pilots and 70 planes, including F-8 Crusaders and A-4 Skyhawks, the plane that flew more bombing missions into North Vietnam than any other naval aircraft. The A-4 was all business. I mean, you were going to be down there on the ground looking at flak. And that's where I thought I should be. 
And that's where I was the day I got shot down. <laughs> From its base in the Tonkin Gulf, 100 miles off the coast of North Vietnam, the U.S. Navy was trying to cut supplies flowing to communist guerrillas fighting in South Vietnam. <laughs> For years, North Vietnam had sent weapons, ammunition, and even people to the South in a drive to reunite the two countries. In support of South Vietnam, President Johnson, in 1965, ordered the U.S. Navy and Air Force to begin bombing the North. He called it Operation Rolling Thunder. I've read since that Rolling Thunder, when it was programmed, was to be something like we saw in Desert Storm. Remember those couple of weeks of dashing air power? But it strung out. It strung out and was just a fancy name for very routine, occasional alpha strikes. Our mission will be an escort and flak suppression. In the parlance of rolling thunder, alpha strikes were multi-plane missions against North Vietnam's militarily significant targets. In such a rural country, U.S. military leaders in 1965 counted just 94 of these targets. We'll be proceeding into the target on a heading of 090. That list became known as the Alpha or A-list. In Operation Rolling Thunder, the decision to strike the A-list targets came from Washington, and not from commanders on the ships. Paul Engel was Jem Stockdale's operations officer. You know, go right by that steel plant, go right by that big production concrete plant, go by all the, the kinds of facilities that would aid and abet the enemy's success and bomb the bejeepers out of uh, the outhouse and come home, uh, having gone through all the fire. It was a mess. We frequently had to wait until way up the late hours of the night into the morning hours before we knew what ordinance to put on airplanes because we didn't know what we were going to be striking. The only exception then was running up and down the roads looking for trucks. Trucks and trains became the most common targets while Hanoi and the port of Haiphong, where Soviet war supplies arrived almost daily, remained, for the time being, untouched. In 1965, Washington refused to grant the Navy permission to attack most of the targets on the Alpha list. So what we were doing was making them mad, but we weren't taking away the wherewithal to fight. That was the sadness of it. And rolling blunder was, was part of it, you know. Continue, I'm gonna hit you a little bit harder if you don't do what I tell you. It's kind of an arrogant approach. You had a man, Secretary of Defense, he was a smart man. He was so smart he thought he could make two and two come out five. That is a very dangerous thing for a smart man to do. We thought there was a language of deterrence out there, that fighting was really a kind of rough form of communication. We were making gestures with our airplanes. That's quite different than the Vietnamese thinking. We thought they would respond with gestures. But they didn't think of it as a gesture. They wondered what we thought we would accomplish by doing that. On September 9th, 1965, Jim Stockdale flew his A-4 Skyhawk over a familiar railroad yard in North Vietnam. I'd been over that the day before and didn't get any flack at all. This day, 
I heard the darn gun, and I looked down there, and here came these fireballs. It had been brought in the night before, 57 millimeter. That plane was on fire and upside down, and there was no getting away from that. I knew I was the only wing commander to live through an ejection. I remembered the code of conduct, Article 4. If I am senior, I will take command. So I was giving myself a pep talk. I said, you're going to take over the leadership of that prison. And everything you've done heretofore is nothing in comparison to how you handle this next period of your life. I saw no hope. In fact, coming down my parachute, I said five years down there at least. And I was turned out to be wrong. It was nearly eight. Jem Stockdale was quickly captured. He became the first prisoner of war from the Oriskany, shot down in an A-4 Skyhawk. The A-4 Skyhawk is small, simple, and inexpensive. Fully loaded to 24,000 pounds, the Skyhawk weighs half what most Navy jets weigh. Designed in 1954, the Douglas Aircraft Company built the Skyhawk with landing gear tall enough to fit a single nuclear bomb under its belly. In Vietnam, the maneuverable Skyhawk gained fame as the sports car of attack planes. Capable of firing missiles or rockets, it most often dropped bombs, two tons of them, every day of the Vietnam War. In 1965 and 66, the North Vietnamese began building much tougher defenses. Most formidably, radar-guided surface-to-air missiles, SAMs. Still, not until 1967, would the A-4 pilots from the Oriskany find out just how strong North Vietnamese defenses had become. In 66, I think I saw total of three SAMs, and, and those weren't even SAMs that were shooting at me. And I tell you, there's a difference. A SAM that you see, and one that you see chasing you are two different SAMs. In 1966, the Navy did begin to outfit the Oriskany's A-4s with radar detection equipment. Pilots would hear an alarm when a radar-guided missile was heading their way. They crammed all the electronics in the belly of the airplane, and then they said, don't fire your 20-millimeter cannons, because if you do, uh, you, you're likely to shake those electronics to pieces. So we were constrained uh, in the use of our 20-millimeter cannon. We could use them in an emergency, but we were told don't use it unless you have to. In 1966, the Americans began picking up the pace of their attacks, with Skyhawks flying 300 miles round trip to strike Haiphong and the outskirts of Hanoi. But the flow of supplies south continued unabated. While on the line in 1966, the Oriskany launched and recovered groups of planes for 12 straight hours, from noon to midnight or midnight to noon. Rested for 12 hours while another carrier took over, then went back at it. Stand by to recover aircraft.
We were undoubtedly operating an aircraft carrier like it had never been operated before. The captain of the Ariskany was John Irabino. After the 12 hours of flying is over, then the people still have to uh, refuel the airplanes, repair them, rearm them again for the next day. And that takes a couple more hours, so that's 14 to 16 hours that these kids are working. In October of 1966, Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara visited the Oriskany. His first question to me was, what is the strike pilot ratio? I told him we had a certain number of pilots on board, we uh, had a certain number of missions, and in order to fly those missions, we had to use the pilots more than one and a half times a day. And I don't think he was really worried about uh, the pilots being overworked. He was worried more about his numbers than anything else. Missions flown, ordnance dropped. These were the measurements of success in the air war over Vietnam. The pilots of the Oriskany were now dropping 300,000 pounds of bombs every day on North Vietnam. I had the feeling towards when we got on the line that it was more important to measure how much ordnance went over the bow than how effective that ordnance was. That was very disturbing. We were under intense, continuing, pressed, press on, on and on operations. And part of that whole pressure is, is the reason in my mind that we had a fire. Two weeks after McNamara's visit, disaster struck. At 7 a.m. on October 26th, an inexperienced sailor stacking magnesium flares in a locker accidentally triggered one. The flare began to burn, and the sailor panicked, threw the burning flare into the locker, and slammed the door. Ideally, of course, if he, if he could have, he should have taken the thing out and thrown it over the side. But I believe he was scared, and, uh, and I believe that most people would have been. The flare ignited more than 600 other flares in the locker, sent a fireball rolling across the ceiling of the hangar deck. Scorching several A-4 Skyhawks, and igniting two helicopters. The biggest enemy of a ship at sea is fire, and you don't have a fire of that magnitude without somebody getting hurt. Toxic smoke and heat poured through the ship's ventilation system and into the officers' quarters where A-4 pilot Dave Carey was sleeping. I remember uh, hearing the fire alarm, waking up, and I opened the door to my stateroom. And it was like there was a, it was like walking into a bag of flour. And the whole passageway was white. Paul Engel led a number of junior officers to safety. We managed to get out of there and get up the hangar deck, and then we started loading bombs, picking them up, manhandling them. There were people picking up 1,000-pound bombs, four or five guys running in, picking them up and throwing them over the side. We could have lost the ship easily with that fire raging. Paul Engel then joined one of the search parties going through every space in the forward part of the ship where officers slept. Three hours after the fire began, Dave Carey was found in the ship's administration office. I remember walking forward and, and the guys from the squadron seeing me and they come running back, there you are, there, you know. And they were delighted to see me, but I didn't realize, you know, why. Because they knew about all these people that were missing and they're bringing up bodies. 
in there, but for the grace of God went I. It took four hours to put the fire out. 44 men were dead, eight sailors and 36 officers, including 24 pilots. Most of them died of asphyxiation. There were two or three that died from burns. He was uh, my air operations officer. It was a very, very difficult uh, ceremony to go through. It was his wish that he be buried at sea. All the others were sent home. When a rebuilt Oriskany returned to the Tonkin Gulf in July of 1967, its sailors would stand mortified and watch as an eerily similar disaster consumed the USS Forrestal. As a morning launch was getting ready to go, a rocket in an F-4 Phantom fired inadvertently and hit the fuel tank directly beneath the seat in the A-4 where John McCain was sitting. There was a huge fire. I shut down the airplane and went out on the refueling probe and rolled through the fire that was already there on the flight deck and ran across the other end of the flight deck. I turned and looked towards the airplanes where the fire was at that time, and I started back, and as I did, the first bomb cooked off and exploded. It was the worst disaster aboard a Navy ship since World War II. 134 men died. 62 planes were damaged or destroyed. With the Forrestal out of commission, John McCain elected to join the Saints, an A-4 attack squadron on the USS Oriskany. Drawing from lessons learned in the Vietnam War, the Navy now builds much safer ships and much safer ordnance. Still, an aircraft carrier remains a tightly packed steel container of people, airplanes, jet fuel, and munitions. The virtual floating bomb. Sure, it happened again. It's almost unavoidable because the weapons are dangerous. They're made to explode. They're made to destroy things. Bottom line is flying combat's dangerous. These tensions are up. Safety's in place. Even in peacetime, the naval flying profession is one of the most dangerous in the world. A naval aviator is five times more likely to die in his plane than in his car. The ship is always moving. It's not a stable platform. It's very small. And a pilot has to learn to fly through a box that's about the size of his airplane and not much larger. The carrier landing strip is just 120 feet long, less than the distance across a baseball diamond from home plate to second base. It is so narrow Pilots must hit the line running down the middle of the deck. Deviations are deadly. Thirty feet too high or too fast and you've missed. It's a bolter. Thirty feet too low 
and too slow, and... Power, power, power. There's only one way to land most Navy jets on an aircraft carrier, and pilots practice it incessantly. You kind of get used to it, but it's never routine. Every landing is very intense, and you're real keyed up for it. The biggest thing about ball calls is a lot of people are calling it early. So make At sure the Naval Air Station in Meridian, Mississippi, it's Chris Rollins' job to teach the Navy's newest aviators to land on an aircraft carrier in the TA-4 Skyhawk. Once ubiquitous in the fleet, the A-4 Skyhawk, with an extra seat for an instructor, is serving its last years in the Navy as a training plane. You know, we joke and say that the most technologically advanced thing in an A-4 is the digital watch you're probably wearing on your wrist. But this one is all manual. It's just you and the plane. At their base in Meridian, a hundred miles from any ocean, the students fly the pattern for shipboard landings almost 80 times before they ever see the ship. Five two, Skyhawk ball, 1.4, Sierra 70, full stop. Roger, ball. Way down, found it. Settle. We get out to the ship, in theory, it's everything that we've experienced before, and you stick to the basics and it'll all work, supposedly. <laughs> I can't believe they're going to let us go. I can't believe the taxpayers are going to let us go. <laughs> On their initiation flight, the students follow their instructors out to the ship. Just out of the blue, you see this tremendous wake, and then at the peak of the wake is this little tiny black piece of steel. And then they, they tell you, that's where you're gonna land. And the whole time I was just shaking my head, no, sorry, <laughs> I can't do it. <laughs> 600 feet above the water, the students fly down the port side of the ship. With the wide left hand 180 degree turn, they line up with the stern of the ship, which keeps moving away from them at 25 miles an hour. Slightly high. We call it squeezing the black juice out of the stick. I was squeezing so hard in the control stick. It's a pretty incredible experience circling over that little carrier down there and, and thinking you're by yourself and you better do it right. You got the one chance. With their eyes on a lens box, they descend, aiming for the three wire, the third of four wires from the ship's stern. If the landing signal officer, the LSO, sees a plane too low, too slow, too wide, or too high to land safely and catch a wire, no way he's got a ball. he turns the green signal lights red. It's a wave off. I lost the bet of my LSO on a no wave offs, bolters, or one wires. First bolter, first time around, is the bet out the window. My third time with the hook down is when I finally got aboard. I didn't hear of anybody winning, so it's rigged. <laughs> I caught a one wire, which was not good. <laughs> Flying off a carrier is as dramatic an experience as flying on. Some think it's more dangerous. Catapulted off the USS John F. Kennedy, the Skyhawk will accelerate from zero to 150 miles per hour in two seconds. 
If his plane malfunctions, the pilot has just a split second to eject. One of the scariest parts was taking your feet off the brakes and going to full power, looking at the ocean in front of you and, and only, yeah, you know, 200 feet of steel. Check all the engine instruments once, check them again, check them again. And then when everything's okay, you roger the cat officer with a salute, put your head back in your seat. And you're, you're pushed back into your seat and the first time, it really it forces the air out of your lungs and everybody's natural reaction is to scream as they go off the end. And I screamed on every single one of them, all 10 cat shots. 10 arrested landings and 10 catapult shots later, and these young men have reached the end of a year and a half of work. 772, trap. They will now move on to learn to fly the Navy's current fleet airplanes, including the F-A-18 Hornet and the AV-8B Harrier. Then they will fly on and off a carrier at night, an experience dreaded by even a seasoned combat veteran. On a small deck carrier like the Oriskany, for example, we didn't have a heck of a lot of lights that would help us line up, so it was kind of like flying into a black hole. In July of 1967, when the repaired Oriskany returned to its battle station, its attack pilots found themselves flying against Alpha List targets in Hanoi and the port city of Haiphong for the first time in the war. So we were doing that three times a day, going into very heavily defended areas that was really beyond the experience base of the guys that had been on the cruise the year before. Jim Busey joined the Saints, one of the Oriskany's attack squadrons, in 1967. 60 to 70% of the squadron, 24 pilots in the squadron, did not have combat experience. In other words, we hadn't been shot at before. So in a case like that, the only way you gain experience is uh, on the job. In the summer of 67, there were missiles in the air all the time and lots of black. It looked like something out of a World War II movie with little black puffs around everywhere. We were losing airplanes right and left, uh, at least in my recollection. You know, we were, we were just losing airplanes like crazy. In just its first week on the line, the Oriskany lost five out of 30 Skyhawks to combat from both the Saints and its sister squadron, the Ghost Riders. Rescue crews picked up four of the five pilots. The other was captured. Brian Compton led the Saints. When you lose five in a week and you say, well, you're going to be over here for 26 weeks, you realize that you had just turned over the air wing before you got through. Our arithmetic wasn't as fancy as McNamara's, but it was that good. And we, <laughs> we knew it was, a, it was a, a different ball game. By the end of August, the Saints and the Ghost Riders had lost another five planes. Six Skyhawk pilots were gone. I saw a very almost uh, macabre kind of an attitude. We were out doing what we thought was right, uh, led, of course, by Brian Compton, who was... Uh, John McCain, now a U.S. senator from Arizona, joined the Saints as a replacement pilot in October of 1967. And yet, behind the bravado and the macho kind of attitude, I did see a great sadness when we would lose uh, a pilot, but when it happened, I think it gave us renewed vigor. 
in renewed uh, our efforts to do as much damage. One of the things we used to say, if we destroy this target, then we won't have to go back. I don't think we really changed tactics. So in other words, we didn't back off. We had some ground rules. In other words, we would not go below 3,000 feet, ordinarily. The, the ground rules, they're not laws. Uh, we would not make a second run on a target, you know, ground rules, not laws. Nineteen sixty seven brought more action in Alpha Strikes. It also brought a new weapon into the war. The first TV guided smart bomb, the Walleye. The pilot locked a camera in the nose of the Walleye on the target. The bomb then followed its line of sight to detonation. As soon as you've released it, you can get out of there. It likes the uh, maximum contrast. So if it's a white building uh, window and the windows looks dark, it will go for that, that point of contrast. And they're very good, they do it. When the Saints arrived in the Tonkin Gulf, they requested to use the walleye to take out the Hanoi Thermal Power Plant, located near a circular peninsula on a lake in downtown Hanoi. A very heavily defended target, very high up on the A-list. We don't want to kill innocent civilian people if we can avoid it. Obviously, if you're going to drop some bombs on a power plant in the middle of town, there's a fair probability that some civilian casualties will occur. And so there's an effort made to try and prevent that. One of them is don't go there. I think they probably had a little spillage concern, but our concern was on the, on the target. <laughs> There were no registered Alabama folders there that I knew of. Three weeks later, approval finally came through. Using the highly accurate walleye, the Saints chose to strike with just six A-4s with F-8 Crusaders for fighter cover. The Air Force ran a diversionary strike against a MiG base northeast of Hanoi. <laughs> Leaving their crusaders outside to watch for MiGs, the Saints approached the city alone. At 10,000 feet, they fanned out, descending at 450 miles an hour they glided in at a 15 degree angle all at once from different points on the compass. They found the power plant shrouded in smoke. From smoke pots, the North Vietnamese placed around the plant to fool the walleye. Jim Busey flew in from the north amid fierce anti-aircraft fire, and the first of 28 surface-to-air missiles. I remember uh, being head down in a cockpit on the, uh, the Sony scope to get the weapon locked on my window, the window that was assigned to me on the, on the power plant. And just as I locked on, the airplane was, was thrown off of that lock. And instead of looking at the thermal power plant, I was looking at the Paul Dolmere Bridge, which was the main bridge across the river in downtown Hanoi. And I was upside down. Hardly missing a beat, Jim Busey righted his airplane, 
relocked the walleye on the power plant and let it go. He looked up to see two surface-to-air missiles. Then I looked out the right wing and saw that it was on fire, that I'd had some anti-aircraft fire going through the wing. Dodging the missiles, Busey escaped to a higher altitude, where thinner air doused the flames engulfing his wing. When he landed back on the Oriskany, he counted 127 holes in his airplane, a testament to the survivability of his tiny Skyhawk. But other than that, it, was, it really was a nice flight. We didn't lose an airplane, uh, so that, that was a big plus. Five of the six walleyes, including Jim Busey's, hit that target, knocking out power to downtown Hanoi. Brian Compton led the strike. They didn't put out any lights that night. We were talking to the registered voters in Hanoi. Brian Compton received the Navy Cross, the Navy's highest honor. Jim Busey also was awarded a Navy Cross. Brian's approach was from the south, and after he released his weapon, he flew on over the power plant and circled it at least twice, taking pictures before he headed on out. In all, Brian Compton took 17 photos of the bomb damage to the Hanoi power plant. Yeah, it's kind of against the rules, but, uh, you know, what are you going to do, send him back to Hanoi? He's already been there. To the members of his squadron, indeed to all of the members of the air wing, Brian Compton was developing a reputation as invulnerable. I have very vivid memories of a flight that I was on with Brian Compton when I was the number three person and the number two person was shot down and crashed inside of Haiphong. Brian Compton was concerned about trying to find out whether the pilot survived or not. And so he kept circling around the city of Haiphong at a very low altitude, around 2,000 feet. They were firing everything. <laughs> Missiles, anti-aircraft guns, I'm sure rifles. <laughs> everything was being fired at us, and he kept circling around, and we'd go John out. is exaggerating. He said I took him over high fog seven times. <laughs> and then I'd see him turn back in, and I'd gulp, and <clears throat> we'd go back in. I, he must have made eight or nine <laughs> trips. You can't but trust these politicians. Honey, they'll lie to you every time. <laughs> The Saints of the Oriskany had many successes that summer and fall of 1967. They blew all the major bridges around Haiphong, temporarily isolating the port city from the rest of the country. Ten days after the power plant strike, Brian Compton was leading a mission against a Haiphong railroad bridge when the SAM alarm sounded in his cockpit. If I see that missile, I'm convinced that I can outmaneuver that missile. And when you got to the right time, you know, you maneuvered violently. I generally prefer to go up, but you can make the movement in any direction. And basically, if you did it at the right time, you could outmaneuver the SAM. In other words, the SAM could not pull enough Gs to track you through that maneuver. Uh, if you screwed up, you know, you know, you, you got you got tagged. On this fateful day. A missile headed straight for Brian Compton's flight of four planes. Brian did what we called a pitch up to the right, away from the rest of us. And 
Dave Curry and Al Stafford were with him. But Sam came up and caught them. He went right, and detonated right between them and uh, blew them both out of the sky. I remember there being a huge explosion. My airplane just stayed on its back and it started spinning and tumbling and gyrating. It was shaking so bad that nothing would focus. And I'd try to look inside at the panel to see what was going on. The instrument panel was just a blur in the cockpit. About the time that I was about to yell, the jet, a shoot came out. All of a sudden, everything was very quiet, except I could hear airplanes, I could hear guns, I could hear anti-aircraft fire, I could hear a lot of shooting, and I'm hanging in a parachute, looked down, and I landed in the middle of a small North Vietnamese village. Uh, he came up on the radio, and uh, his little handheld emergency radio, and uh, I asked him if he was all right. And he said, you know we cannot come and get you. At which point I couldn't think of anything clever to say anymore, and Dean said... There was no way I could bring a helo in to try and extract him. And besides which, he was surrounded by people. So uh, if we'd have tried to fish him out, they'd have shot him anyway. So, so I told him, well, there's nothing I can do, Dave. I'll see you. <laughs> and he flew away. And I stood out there in the middle of that rice paddy. It was like I was the only person in the entire world, universe. I was by myself, alone, out there. And uh, that started what would turn out for me to be a little longer than five and a half years in prison in North Vietnam. Running very low on pilots and planes, the Saints cast about for volunteers. Overall flow today, as we've done the John McCain, on the Forestall when fire consumed that ship, signed up. On October 26, 1967, less than a month after he arrived on the Oriskany, John McCain volunteered for a strike on the now repaired Hanoi Thermal Power Plant the same destination as the Saints' award-winning mission of August. He did want to go on that strike, and since I was the ops officer and wrote the flight schedule, he did come to me and insist on going on that flight, so I stuck him in there as a wingman. My nickname for him was Gregory Greenass, uh, because he was a new boy, hadn't been in combat before. Most of us felt, as I did, that it was very, very unlikely that I'd be shot down. As I released the bombs, I had just started to pull back on the stick when the surface-to-air missile struck the right wing, and it gyrated very violently straight down, and I ejected. Uh, and according to reports, uh, my chute opened just as my feet touched the lake. Unconscious, John McCain landed in a lake in the center of the city in the middle of the day. And so when I hit the water, it woke me up and I went down to the bottom and I couldn't get up to the surface. I tried to use my arms and I couldn't and I reached down with my teeth and was able to get my teeth around the toggle and, and pull it and inflate the life vest. Came to the surface and there were Vietnamese swimming out. McCain broke both his arms and his knee, ejecting from his A-4 Skyhawk. The mob that pulled him from the lake stabbed him and broke his shoulder. He was taken to the infamous Hanoi Hilton, where Jim Stockdale had spent the last two years. He was probably more beat up when he got to prison than anybody that ever lived through a, a rough ride and a rough treatment after he got picked up. McCain was the 16th pilot from the Oriskany killed or captured since July. By the end of their 1967 deployment to Vietnam, one out of three members of the Saints had died in combat or been captured. Of their 15 original planes, not one 
remained. In the three years of Operation Rolling Thunder, the Oriskany had lost 38 pilots and 60 planes, including 29 Skyhawks, to combat, the highest loss rate of any carrier in the war. In the fall of 1967, the Navy sent a safety team to investigate the tactics of the pilots. They were very quick to see that what we were doing in the summer and fall of 1967 was significantly different than what had been done before. It didn't have anything to do with tactics or equipment uh, uh, or new weapons on the part of the enemy. It was just the fact that probability and statistics were hitting us. But the one thing we didn't do, we didn't back off. And, and maybe that was wrong. And maybe my leadership was defective because I had not given people a, a uh, I didn't offer that as an option. You know, the, the option was we came to fight and that's what I expect you to do. Yeah, he was aggressive. Yeah, he went in and did the job that we had trained for. Uh, but so did the sister squadron, uh, the, their CO and their XO. Uh, and I don't think there was any pattern there, so I, I can't give you an answer. I don't know why it turned out that way. It just did. When the bombardment failed to deter the North Vietnamese, President Johnson ended Operation Rolling Thunder in 1968. Five years later, in 1973, John McCain, Dave Carey, and Jim Stockdale came home. Jim Stockdale was awarded the Medal of Honor. During his eight years in prison in Hanoi, he led American prisoners of war in near unanimous defiance of their brutal captors. In 1993, the remains of the last Oriskany pilot and the last saint to die in Operation Rolling Thunder came home. 24-year-old Ralph Foulkes was an A-4 Skyhawk pilot killed on a routine road reconnaissance mission over North Vietnam on January 5th, 1968. And I tell you here today that I stand before the company of heroes and future heroes in our Navy and our Marine Corps. May you always fly a center ball. May you never forget to drop your hook. The men who lead the Navy today were the youngest officers in Vietnam. The last of a generation torn apart by war, now teaching the lessons of that conflict to the first generation born too late to remember it. Don't, don't worry, I'm a naval aviator. <laughs> visited the Oriskany. His first question to me was, what is the strike pilot ratio? I told him we had a certain number of pilots on board, we uh, had a certain number of missions, and in order to fly those missions, we had to use the pilots more than one and a half times a day. And I don't think he was really worried about uh, the pilots being overworked. He was worried more about his numbers than anything else.
missions flown, ordnance dropped. These were the measurements of success in the air war over Vietnam. The pilots of the Oriskany were now dropping 300,000 pounds of bombs every day on North Vietnam. I had the feeling towards when we got on the line that it was more important to measure how much ordnance went over the bow than how effective that ordnance was. That was very disturbing. We were under intense, continuing, pressed, press on, on and on operations. And part of that whole pressure is, is the reason in my mind that we had a fire. Two weeks after McNamara's visit, disaster struck. At 7 a.m. on October 26th, an inexperienced sailor stacking magnesium flares in a locker accidentally triggered one. The flare began to burn, and the sailor panicked, threw the burning flare into the locker, and slammed the door. Ideally, of course, if he, if he could have, he should have taken the thing out and thrown it over the side. But I believe he was scared, and, uh, and I believe that most people would have been. The flare ignited more than 600 other flares in the locker, sent a fireball rolling across the ceiling of the hangar deck. Scorching several A-4 Skyhawks, and igniting two helicopters. The biggest enemy of a ship at sea is fire, and you don't have a fire of that magnitude without somebody getting hurt. Toxic smoke and heat poured through the ship's ventilation system and into the officers' quarters where A-4 pilot Dave Carey was sleeping. I remember uh, hearing the fire alarm, waking up, and I opened the door to my stateroom. And it was like there was a, it was like walking into a bag of flour. And the whole passageway was white. Paul Engel led a number of junior officers to safety. We managed to get out of there and get up the hangar deck, and then we started loading bombs, picking them up, manhandling them. There were people picking up 1,000-pound bombs, four or five guys running in, picking them up and throwing them over the side. We could have lost the ship easily with that fire raging. Pull low to the ground, you can get it so high you can't hardly see Vietnam. As a matter of fact, some of those guys, I think, would have lofted the bombs in from the coastline if they could, but, you know, his attitude was to get in there and, and to, to hit the target. On board the Oriskany, under Jim Stockdale's command, 120 pilots and 70 planes, including F-8 Crusaders and A-4 Skyhawks, the plane that flew more bombing missions into North Vietnam than any other naval aircraft. A4 was all business. I mean, you were going to be down there on the ground looking at flak. And that's where I thought I should be. And that's where I was the day I got shot down. <laughs> From its base in the Tonkin Gulf, 100 miles off the coast of North Vietnam, the U.S. Navy was trying to cut supplies flowing to communist guerrillas fighting in South Vietnam. For years, North Vietnam had sent weapons, ammunition, and even people to the South in a drive to reunite the two countries. In support of South Vietnam, President Johnson, in 1965, 
ordered the US Navy and Air Force to begin bombing the North. He called it Operation Rolling Thunder. I've read since that Rolling Thunder, when it was programmed, was to be something like we saw in Desert Storm. Remember those couple of weeks of dashing air power? But it strung out. It strung out and was just a fancy name for very routine, occasional alpha strikes. Our mission will be an escort and flak suppression in the parlance of Rolling Thunder, Alpha Strikes were multi-plane missions against North Vietnam's militarily significant targets. In such a rural country, U.S. military leaders, in 1965, counted just 94 of these targets. We'll be proceeding into the target on a heading of 090. That list became known as the Alpha, or A-list. In Operation Rolling Thunder, the decision to strike the A-list targets came from Washington, and not from commanders on the ships. Paul Engel was Jem Stockdale's operations officer. You know, go right by that steel plant, go right by that big production concrete plant, go by all the, the kinds of facilities that would aid and abet the enemy's success and bomb the bejeepers out of uh, the outhouse and come home, uh, having gone through all the fire. It was a mess. We frequently had to wait until way up the late hours of the night into the morning hours before we knew what ordinance to put on airplanes because we didn't know what we were going to be striking. The only exception then was running up and down the roads looking for trucks. Trucks and trains became the most common targets while Hanoi and the port of Haiphong, where Soviet war supplies arrived almost daily, remained, for the time being, untouched. In 1965, Washington refused to grant the Navy permission to attack most of the targets on the Alpha list. So what we were doing was making them mad but we weren't taking away the wherewithal to fight. That was the sadness of it. And rolling blunder was, was part of it, you know. Continue, I'm gonna hit you a little bit harder if you don't do what I tell you. It's kind of an arrogant approach. You had a man, Secretary of Defense, he was a smart man. He was so smart he thought he could make two and two come out five. That is a very dangerous thing for a smart man to do. We thought there was a language of deterrence out there, that fighting was really a kind of rough form of communication. We were making gestures with our airplanes. That's quite different than the Vietnamese thinking. We thought they would respond with gestures. But they didn't think of it as a gesture. They wondered what we thought we would accomplish by doing that. On September 9th, 1965, Jim Stockdale flew his A-4 Skyhawk over a familiar railroad yard in North Vietnam. I'd been over that the day before and didn't get any flack at all. This day, I heard the darn gun, and I looked down there, and here came these fireballs. It had been brought in the night before, 57 millimeter. That plane was on fire and upside down, and there was no getting away from that. I knew I was the only wing commander to live through an ejection. I remembered the code of conduct, Article 4. If I am senior, I will take command. So I was giving myself a pep talk. I said, you're going to take over the leadership of that prison. 
and everything you've done heretofore is nothing in comparison to how you handle this next period of your life. I saw no hope. In fact, coming down my parachute, I said five years down there at least, and that was turned out to be wrong. It was nearly eight. Jem Stockdale was quickly captured. He became the first prisoner of war from the Oriskany, shot down in an A-4 Skyhawk. The A-4 Skyhawk is small, simple, and inexpensive. Fully loaded to 24,000 pounds, the Skyhawk weighs half what most Navy jets weigh. Designed in 1954, the Douglas Aircraft Company built the Skyhawk with landing gear tall enough to fit a single nuclear bomb under its belly. Ladies and gentlemen, we proudly present America's 26 newest naval aviators. Just two weeks ago, these student pilots of the Naval Air Station at Meridian, Mississippi, flew their A-4 Skyhawks over the ocean for the first time. First Lieutenant Cherry Carrot qualified in the A-4 on board USS John F. Kennedy. They approached an aircraft carrier 100 miles off the coast of Florida. Lieutenant J.G. Michael C. Crisp, call sign Critter. Remembered to drop their hooks. J.G. Bartell was named to the Commodore's list during the advanced... Slammed onto the deck at 150 miles an hour. And caught a wire. In the Navy's oldest airplane, they have become the newest members of the elite tail hook fraternity. It's 90% attitude and 10% ability, by the way. <laughs> To each and every one of the new wingies, I wish you all the very best in the days ahead. It will be at least a year before these men are truly ready to face the test of combat. But in the plane they fly, the A-4 Skyhawk, and in the tactics they use, they confront every day the history of one of the Navy's longest battles. In 1966, our country was already becoming embroiled in the conflict in Southeast Asia, in a small country by the name of Vietnam. We went out to win the war. We fully expected to win the war and get it over with. We didn't drop our bombs and go home. We dropped our bombs and went and looked. We were out there to find some trucks to, to blow them up. Oh, wow. To find the barge and sink it. We wanted to get a little hate and discontent in the game. In 1967, at the height of the air war over North Vietnam, Brian Compton commanded an A-4 attack squadron called the Saints on the USS Oriskany. The attack pilots of the Oriskany saw more action and suffered more combat losses over North Vietnam than any other group in the Navy. The ball game is a different one once you go into combat. And you've got to use all the instincts you have to become uh, an elusive, uh, sure-footed fighter. Is there anybody here who doesn't know who this great man is? Jim Stockdale is probably best known today for his 1992 debut on the national political stage. In 1965, he was leading the pilots of the Oriskany into combat for the first time. The ability to improvise and to know that all of that peacetime stuff is out the window. A lot of people give that up very, very hesitantly. Jim started off, you know, working fairly long. In 
Vietnam, the maneuverable Skyhawk gained fame as the sports car of attack planes. Capable of firing missiles or rockets, it most often dropped bombs, two tons of them, every day of the Vietnam War. In 1965 and 66, the North Vietnamese began building much tougher defenses. Most formidably, radar-guided surface-to-air missiles, SAMs. Still, not until 1967, would the A-4 pilots from the Oriskany find out just how strong North Vietnamese defenses had become. In 66, I think I saw a total of three SAMs, and, and those weren't even SAMs that were shooting at me. And I tell you, there's a difference. A SAM that you see and one that you see chasing you are two different SAMs. In 1966, the Navy did begin to outfit the Oriskany's A-4s with radar detection equipment. Pilots would hear an alarm when a radar-guided missile was heading their way. They crammed all the electronics in the belly of the airplane, and then they said, don't fire your 20-millimeter cannons, because if you do, uh, you, you're likely to shake those electronics to pieces. So we were constrained uh, in the use of our 20 millimeter cannon. We could use them in an emergency, but we were told, don't use it unless you have to. In 1966, the Americans began picking up the pace of their attacks, with Skyhawks flying 300 miles round trip to strike Haiphong and the outskirts of Hanoi. But the flow of supplies south continued unabated. While on the line in 1966, the Oriskany launched and recovered groups of planes for 12 straight hours from noon to midnight, or midnight to noon. Rested for 12 hours while another carrier took over, then went back at it. Stand by to recover aircraft. We were undoubtedly operating an aircraft carrier like it never been operated before. The captain of the Oriskany was John Irobino. After the 12 hours of flying is over, then the people still have to uh, refuel the airplanes, repair them, rearm them again for the next day. And that takes a couple more hours, so that's 14 to 16 hours that these kids are working. In October of 1966, Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara